If you have a Bible with you, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 26 today. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 26. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, if you, were, you left home and you were like, oh, I knew I was forgetting something, that's okay. We've got Bibles in front of you in the pew that we encourage you to use. So Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 26, we're continuing on in this sermon series of going through the book of Acts together. And this morning I'm going to be reading these verses from the New American Standard Bible. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms and those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John to go when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety We had made him walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses." And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your fathers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled." Therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren." To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise all the prophets who have also announced these days, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and the covenant of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. And may the Lord bless us as we read his word together this morning. You ever come across a a warning label for a product, something you use or something you consume, and, and you thought, why in the world would they include such wording that they do on this label. Isn't it obvious? Let me give you a few examples of what I mean. On the bottle of Nitol, which is a sleeping agent, it says, 
may cause drowsiness. <laughs> On a chainsaw, it says do not hold the wrong end of a chainsaw. On a jet ski, it says never use a lit match or open flame to check fuel level. On a sunshade for a car, the one, things that you put in the front windshield, you know, it says do not drive with sunshield in place. Some of these things you're thinking, really? Is this for real? And I, this is all real things on warning labels of these products. On a carton of eggs, it says product may contain eggs. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> on a deer crossing sign, it says deer crossing only for the next four miles. I hope the deer know that. Because from this point to this point, they're allowed to cross, right? And no, nothing beyond that. On a skid loader, it says avoid death. On a washing machine, it says do not put any person in this washer. For a Dremel rotary tool, it says this product is not intended for the use of a dental drill. You got some people out there, I suppose. A couple more. On a Superman Halloween costume, it says this costume does not enable flight or super strength. And lastly, on a vanishing fabric marker, it says not to be used as a writing instrument for signing checks or any legal documents. There's some pretty wacky labels out there, isn't there? And Yet at the same time, there's some pretty la wacky labels for so-called Christians as well that we see today. Some well-deserved labels, though, like a nut job for Kenneth Copeland, or false teacher like Joel Osteen, or money-hungry scammer that needs $65 million for their private jet so they can do ministry like Creflo Dollar did. But there's also those unfair, untrue, misunderstood labels that true Christians get. Labels like, we as followers of Christ are hateful, bigoted, haughty, enemies of the state, and so forth. Many, many people in our culture today look at the church in that way. An organization or a group of people that are stereotyped in some of the ways that I just described. When it comes to particular actors and the roles that, that they play in the movies that they're in, we come to expect that they'll only play certain roles in particular movies, right? Like Jason Statham or The Rock, if they're in a movie, we can expect that the, those movies are probably going to be action movies, that they're not going to star as like the lead role in a romantic film. Sylvester Stallone is not going to be in a movie where he's going to a book club. And you could bet your bottom dollar that if you watch a movie with Matthew McConaughey in it, that at some point during the movie he's going to have his shirt off. As the early church was beginning, the disciples were already getting labeled and particularly raising some eyebrows after the first post-Jesus ascension miracle. And that is what we're going to be focusing on today. What I want to zero in on, on in particular from our text, is see how this first miracle that Peter and John are involved in what about this miracle stands out? And what we can take away from it and apply to our lives today. So that's what we're going to do. But before we do that, let's ask the Lord's blessing by going to him in prayer. Lord, we come before you. And Father, I pray that today as we look at this text, that there's something from it that you speak to our hearts about. Lord, I pray that um, through what we're going to see through what we're going to read, through what we're going to be discussing here. Lord, I ask that your name is glorified and praised. 
I pray, Lord, that we have this desire to want to be more like you. That we're not content to be where we're at spiritually. But that we have this desire to want to grow. That we have this desire to want to obey you more. To cast those sins that we hold so dear aside and walk in holiness with you. Lord, give us that desire. Forgive us for the times that we mess up. Help us to strain and press forward through the power of the Holy Spirit for your glory and for your honor. And we lift these things to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to cover four important things that we see in this first miracle. And the outline for this is in your bulletin if you want to follow along. So four important things that we see in this first miracle. Here's the first. God's authentication of Jesus. God's authentication of Jesus. Look at, look at verses 15 and 16 of our text here. Actually, I'll back up to verse 14. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Miracles were God's way of validating that the apostles were acting with God's power within them. Hebrews 2, 3 through 4, this is from the NIV version, says, How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to to his will. Miracles were God's way of saying, this is really me. It's like a divine signature that could not be forged. You might be someone, or someone here who's watching online might be someone will say, well, I'm an educated person. And I don't, I don't believe in miracles. There's always a reasonable explanation for this and for that instead of being attributed to a miracle. To that, I would say, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, you are acknowledging the possibility of miracles. Just take, for example, the very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Believing in God is an acceptance that miracles are possible. It reminds me of the traveler who was stopped by U.S. Customs. A traveler was found by a U.S. Customs official to be carrying a half-gallon bottle in from Mexico. The official asked the man what it contained. The traveler replied, oh, it's just holy water. I took it from the shrine I visited. The inspector was suspicious and opened the bottle and took a sniff. He shouted, this isn't holy water, it's tequila. The traveler, traveler then lifted up his eyes without a beat and cried out, good heavens, yet another miracle. As we think about the ministry that Jesus had here on earth over 2,000 years ago, one thing that we see in the Gospels is that God surrounded Christ's ministry with miracles to authenticate his message. And there's really no other way to explain that. If you were to look at Matthew 11, 4 through 5, we're not going to look at this today. But if you were to look at Matthew 11, 4 through 5, 
when John the Baptist was arrested and was about to be killed, he started to have some questions as he sat in that cell. And he sent some of his uh, followers or servants or whatnot to Jesus to say, are you the one that we're to be expecting or should we wait for someone else? And Jesus didn't reply and send a message back to John by saying, of course I am. Just convince John of that. Just here, I'll write a note and I'll sign it and I'll say, of course I am. What Jesus did, part of the answer that Jesus gave to these uh, disciples of John to give back to John was, look at the miracles. Look at what I've done. And that should be proof enough. So as Peter said here in verses 22 through 23, look at these verses here of our text. It says, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So as Peter said this here, he's essentially saying, are you listening? Are you listening? God delivered Christ to be the Lord and only way to eternal life with God. Are you listening? This is an authentication of Jesus. Here's the second thing. Second important thing that we see in this first miracle is the coming restoration of all things. The coming restoration of all things. This miracle that we see in our text here was a pointing forward to the future restoration that Scripture talks about. For this, let's start where Peter mentions this. Look back here at verses 19 through 21. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. The Jews would have been reminded of what Isaiah, the prophet, would have said when Peter said these words here. Isaiah says in 35, 6a, oh, that's not it. Let's look at that. <laughs> Isaiah 35, 6. Isaiah 35, the beginning part of verse 6. It says, Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. That would have been a reminder that would have popped into their minds when Peter's saying these words. And as we looked at last week, Isaiah had also explained that God would send Jesus to purchase the healing of God's elect. When in Isaiah 53, verse 5, he wrote the words, By his wounds you are healed. It is through Christ and his work, his finished work on that cross and through that empty tomb, that all of the pain will eventually be reversed. It's like what Paul wrote in Romans 8, 23 through 20, or 22 through 23, it says, For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us.
That's the future. That's our future. So does that mean from now on anyone who believes in Jesus will have healing? Whatever ailment, whatever disease, whatever disability that we have? Not on this side of glory if it's not God's will. So what this healing here in Acts chapter 3 was, was a sign. After all, there were a lot of sick people in Jerusalem at this time. Peter healed one, in part because it was a sign of the full restoration to come in the future. The restoration that Jesus is going to bring when he returns and rules and reigns as king forever and ever. Amen? Amen. All these miracles that we read about, that Jesus did in the Gospels, all of them that are listed here in the book of Acts, they all point us to a world of how God originally created it. And one day, it will be that way again when he returns. So for those of us who are in pain, that's good news, right? That's one of our great hopes. And it's a sustaining joy to know that this is all just temporary. Many of you know who Joni Erickson Tata is the woman who was paralyzed in a diving accident as a teenager. Here's something beautiful that she once said about the Christian's future. She says, I can still hardly believe it. I, with shriveled, bent fingers, muscles that don't work, gnarled knees, and no feeling from the shoulders down, will one day have a new body, light, bright, and clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine the hope this gives someone who has a spinal cord injury like me? Or someone who is cerebral palsied, brain injured, who has multiple sclerosis? Imagine the hope this gives someone who is manic depressive. No other religion, no other philosophy promises new bodies, hearts, and minds. Only the gospel of Christ and through the gospel of Christ do hurting people find such incredible hope. Here's the third thing. The third truth of things that we see here in this first miracle is our need for salvation. Our need for salvation. The physical ailments that some people endure point to the heart condition that we have. Look at verses 4 through 6 of our text. It says, But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. Some people can't walk. Some people are blind. Some of other, some physical debilitations. Maybe a disease. But what Ephesians says is that every one of us are spiritually blind. That's something every one of us is born with, a spiritual blindness. That is, until the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us, opens our eyes to the truth of the gospel, and makes us a new creation. In this particular case here in our text, this physical illness or sickness, was an inward pointing that was used to show us the sickness of our souls. The lame lame man here in Acts 
3 first asks for money. But Peter tells the man that he's, what he's asking for is good, but what he can give him is so much better. And instead of giving him money, God used Peter to perform this miracle to have this lame man walk. Eventually in chapter 4 of Acts, the guy becomes a disciple of Jesus, which is an even greater gift yet. If you're listening, say amen. amen. As bad as suffering is, there's something that's much worse. And that is being crippled and dead in our sins. As wonderful as physical healing is, there's something that's infinitely better. And that is being saved through the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here's this guy sitting by the temple each day, probably thinking, if I could just walk, I'd never be unhappy again. Maybe you can identify. Maybe you've said something similar to that at some point and in some way in your life. If I could just get that promotion, if I could just get that house, if I could just reconcile that relationship, if I could just feel healthy again, if I could just get that Toyota Tacoma, I would be happy. And the list goes on and on. We all have something that we think if we could just receive it, it would satisfy us. But the thing is, many people have those very things and are miserable. And the reason is that, that we need something more than power, more than position, more than relationships, more than material possessions, more than good health. We need a restored relationship to God through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you have that, then get the Tacoma, right? Yeah. No, I'm, no. I'm. Physical healing without soul healing is not only worthless, but it can potentially even be harmful. We've all heard of stories of individuals who, who maybe had a near-death experience. Maybe it was a car crash. And the doctors and the surgeons say, you're lucky to be alive. And maybe that individual who was injured for a short period of time after that lives their life as if, uh, from this day forward, I promise, I'm going to live for, for the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to church. I'm, I'm going to follow God's word. I'm, I'm going to do whatever it, it, it can. So my life is a reflection of thankfulness for what you've done. But it's not long after that. They start living just the way that they were before they made that promise. Yes, physical healing without soul healing or spiritual restoration and renewal can be very harmful, eternally harmful. So whatever pain you're going through, the richest of all possessions is to be reconciled to God through Jesus. So this miracle here in our text was also a pointing towards the need for salvation. Here's the last. The last important thing that we see in this first miracle is the direction of our mission. The direction of our mission. Do you want to know how Peter and John were rewarded by the people for this miracle? Look at Acts 4, 1 through 3. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. Did you catch that? No reward. 
No praise. No hold there so we can take a picture of you and put it on People Magazine cover. No, give me a second while I put this on Instagram. No, I'm going to share this on Facebook of how great this is. They get thrown into jail. Here's a little tidbit of bad news from the book of Acts. Anytime, anytime that we see miracles take place in this book, the miracle worker usually finds themselves in some sort of trouble following that. It's kind of different from the hero stories and movies that we all love. When the hero in those stories or movies get some sort of uh, superpower, their powers usually make them hard to stop, if not invincible. But when God gives us power, it makes us vulnerable and still dependent upon him. The exchange here in our text for today was one man was relieved of his suffering while Peter and John had to suffer for it. One guy gets to walk while two guys get thrown into prison. Now before you start getting all worked up and say, well, that's not fair. Let me remind you that this is exactly what happened to Jesus. When he rose Lazarus, from the dead, from that point on, the scriptures say that the Pharisees determined to kill him. One pastor says this about that. He says, by taking Lazarus out of the grave, Jesus put himself in. You know that there's a word for this that Bible scholars use. It's called Substitution. It's the act of someone voluntarily suffering so that another doesn't. I bet you know where I'm going with this. Substitution. Jesus suffered and died and took the punishment for our sins so that through him we wouldn't have to suffer the wrath of God. And because he did that for us, and because he did that for Peter and John, the message and the mission of sharing this gospel went outward. It wasn't kept to themselves. It wasn't even kept to themselves when they were in prison. And as we're going to see next week, it wasn't that they left it in the prison either when they got out. We're going to see next week, here's a little snip, uh, a sneak peek of that. The result of this of what we're reading today, not only led to imprisonment, but they got scourged. They got beaten as a result of it. And what's their response, John and, and, and Peter? It wasn't them licking their wounds. It wasn't them saying, this is not worth it. It wasn't them saying, I didn't sign up for this. It wasn't them saying, I didn't see this in the brochure. It was them saying and praising God that they could count themselves worthy to be suffering for the, for the sake of the gospel. They rejoiced as a result of being beat for what they did and what they shared. Boy, that's different than what we see in churches today, isn't it? Someone made a rude comment to me. Someone didn't shake my hand. Someone sat in my pew. That's where I've been sitting for 30 years. How can I go and worship anymore when I can't sit in the same spot? We, we chuckle at this sort of thing, but there's actual individuals in churches across this nation who have petty things like that that causes them to not want to share the gospel, to not want to fellowship, to not praise the Lord. And that you, you read about individuals who are beaten and thrown into prison and count it 
wonderful to be able to share this gospel message. Folks, you and I as followers of Christ may be labeled some pretty derogatory things. And as this world waxes worse until the return of Christ, don't expect that to change. Be ready to suffer. Be ready for what we could see here in our country, maybe in our lifetime, of a shift. And us as the church facing what we haven't had to face in this country, but what other Christians are facing and have faced in other parts of the world for a while. But don't let that deter you. Don't let that deter you from pressing on. Don't let that deter you from sharing the gospel, from standing upon the truth of the word of God unwaveringly. Even in the face of persecution, even if our loved ones turn us away, God never promised to prevent any suffering from entering our lives. But he did promise that he would be with us every step of the way through it. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. And Lord, I don't know how this message finds particular people here today. Maybe there was something that resonated with them. But I pray, Lord, that it just is a, an encouragement for us. An encouragement for us to see how valuable and precious the gospel is. I pray that this is a message that we preach to ourselves every single day, no matter how long we've been walking with you. Because just because we know you now doesn't mean that we need to, be, to stop reminding ourselves of what we've been saved from. So Lord, help us to live grateful, obedient lives. Help us to stand strong in the faith in a world that is increasingly becoming more hostile to the gospel message. May you grow your church and we cling to the promise that you made that your church will endure to the end and that nothing can stop it, and no one can stop it. How glorious that is to be a part of the kingdom of God, an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom where we will see you face to face one day and give you praise and glory in a way that we never could have here on earth. Thank you for that. And we lift these things to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.